Hey guys, can you hear me? Man, I feel old. What's happening? I'm just waiting for a few more faces to show up. How's my voice? See, when I don't trim my beard, I look old. Can I get a sound test? Can you guys hear me? All righty then. Yeah, I'll look on this. Carm, how are you, sister? Good to see you. Jonathan, what's happening? Good, good. Okay. Alex, what's up, bro? Okay, good, good. <clears throat> Orthodox Christian sermons. How are you? How are you doing, guys? Jesus saves. Repent. Amen. I was just saying, see, when I don't trim my beard, I look old. White beard. I feel old. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Let's pray that the regular gang will show up. By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we won't get distractions like we did yesterday. Abdel, Abd al, this is, your name kills me. It's Abd a Halij, but the a right before Halij makes me want to say Abdel Halij. Shalom Rabba. God bless you, brother. Good to see every one of you, man. Do we have an intense session yesterday? Woo wee! So, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Father of mercies, the Father of Lord Jesus, flood us and drown us and cleanse us and purify us in the holy blood of Jesus Christ. To be purified, cleansed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Father, forgive us and save us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, and fill us with the Holy Spirit. And please forgive us, Father. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Holy Spirit, forgive us. Please save me from being a hypocrite in Jesus' name. We'll pray more intensely in a moment. Just waiting for enough of you guys to show up. As you can see, I try to come in when I can. I don't have a set schedule. <clears throat> but if you guys are praying for me, pray in Jesus' name. I'm firmly planted in the state. Pray in Jesus' name for miraculous favor with everyone that I encounter in Jesus' name. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ that the Lord will guide me to find a place so I can then have my own internet and can set specific hours daily to join you pray in Jesus name that the Lord Jesus will help me to remain pure and holy in love with Jesus being a doer of his word because sometimes the flesh is weak in my case a lot of times and I'm pretty much just by myself without my precious angels pray for my angels the Lord Jesus bless them and fill them and flood them in his love and pray for the provisions in Jesus name right so Eric to treat Thank you. So keep those prayer requests in mind. I'm here at Child of God's home. <clears throat> Child of God is not just a soldier of Jesus Christ. He's one of my best friends. He's one of my dearest brothers. He loves me for the sake of Jesus and wants to see me shine for Jesus. So he allows me to come in his home even when he's not here. Use his <clears throat> study room and his internet connection for free. Pray for him, his lovely wife, his three children and his immediate family, his sisters, and so on. He's an amazing man of God who loves the Lord. Yep, he's from Paltok. Exactly. You got it. Broken Made Beautiful Ministries. I'm doing fine, provided Jesus Christ, my Lord, saves me from that wicked, corrupt, evil, legal decision. And you guys know I've been like a broken record. Some people tell me I'm too open. I shouldn't be. But, you know, I'm trying to be as honest as I can. But at the same time, sensitive, because I know there are people out there who hate me and want to use anything against me to slander me, right? But uh, beautiful, broken, made, beautiful ministries. If the Lord Jesus miraculously intervenes and saves me from this wicked judge's decision, where she ordered me to pay my ex-wife's legal fees, $40,000, I'll be more than fine. If it's my debt, it's one thing. It's not, right? But this is the evil, satanic world we live in, this evil, satanic system, right? So I'm still waiting for deliverance. I'm still waiting in Jesus' name for deliverance, and I'll be okay. But one thing I can tell you before I begin, <clears throat> I'm just waiting for Protestant believers to show up. Brother Sam, my main man, the lion heart me, and my brother is praying for you. From the, the, Thank you, scammers. God bless you all. Jesus is saying, good to see you. How are you, sister? Stick around. Don't leave. We're going to go in to meet by the power of the Holy Spirit, filling us with wisdom and knowledge for the glory of Jesus. Okay. One thing I can tell you, we truly are living in some troublous times. And I want you to hear me clearly, trusting the Spirit to take over my mouth to speak without error for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's just a catchy title. A stash, PHL, what I'm doing is 
I'm changing the titles of my sessions to draw Muslims, hoping that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the sincere Muslims will come and hear, be convicted, and turn away from this false prophet Muhammad and fall in love with Jesus. See, it got your attention, didn't it, Snash? <laughs> yeah, clickbait. It got your attention. <laughs> Pray for me, man. I have not shaved. I look like an old man. I feel like an old man. And I got coffee stained teeth. Ain't I attractive? Somebody slap me. You do have to admit, before I get into the session, <clears throat> don't even insult Goliath. You, ha you do have to admit, if I didn't make it as a minister, I could have made it as a stand-up comedian, but sitting down, right? With all my goofy expressions and impersonations. Yeah, please do hit the like button and pray that the Lord will Lord will use my meager efforts, my imperfect efforts for the glory of Christ. <clears throat> Somebody slap me. <laughs> what was I saying? I was going to say something. Hey, what's up, Big Al? How's everything going on your end? Here, this is what I want to say. You will not believe the disgusting infighting amongst us brothers in ministry you will not believe the disgusting infighting amongst us brothers in ministry and lord jesus have mercy on me i too was part of the infighting because of things that happen we can really see a concerted effort from the evil one to attack our witness <clears throat> to destroy our unity so that we can bring shame to the name of jesus christ now remember this Unity that's not based on the truth of God's word is a false unity. It's a satanic deception. We can only be united on the foundation of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that truth is found in the Holy Bible. Now, with that said, there are areas we can agree to disagree and still be brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Christ, right? <clears throat> right? May the Lord Jesus loosen my tongue to speak clearly. The debate is, what are those essential doctrines of the Christian faith that we all must agree on and cannot disagree? You see, that's the debate. I would say early on when I first came into the faith and when I started doing apologetics, and I have to confess, and I say this, and I pray God will protect me from error and purify my heart in the blood of Jesus, not to be a crowd pleaser, not to tickle ears, but not to be unnecessarily offensive. I was very staunchly anti-Catholic when I first started because I was raised among a certain group of Christians, independent fundamentalist Baptists. They were King James only. And I was raised on chick tracks. And <clears throat> I really had a hard time with the Catholic Church. And I really thought it was one of the most wicked, wickedly antichrist systems out there. And as a matter of fact, it's just a matter of fact, historically, the Protestant reformers thought the Pope was the antichrist, but the Catholic Church also condemned Protestantism, not as separated brethren, but as schismatics, right? As schismatics. Things have changed. Now you have among Protestants, right? Among Protestants, those who believe that there are true believers born of the Spirit who are Roman Catholic, though they do not agree with the Roman Catholic Church and all its teachings. And you have Roman Catholics who now will say that Protestants are separated brethren. But historically, historically, you, many of you guys know, the Roman Catholic Church condemned Protestants as schismatics. So there was no salvation outside of the Catholic Church if you re rejected it. And Protestants condemned the Pope as Antichrist, right? You guys know this. You guys know this. Guys, remember, keep it G-rated. Okay. Now, I was raised among those who thought that behind every conspiracy, there was a Jesuit. Behind every division, there was or there is an Illuminati, right? So you have this that's called the Black Pope. He actually calls the shots, and he works with the Illuminati, and he works with the Jesuits, and these Jesuits are agents of Satan. They infiltrate and pretend to be Protestants to destroy. Pro you know, I was raised on that. It got to the point I got paranoid. I even got paranoid about my Protestant pastor. Right? I thought he was a plant, an Illuminati plant. 
a plant by the Jesuits, right? Choose Jesus. So you know what I'm talking about, right? You're following a similar path to mine. All right? So now I'm at a point after much reflection, much meditation, and I know a lot of people are going to get upset at me. That's okay. You can be upset at me. I'm at a point where I believe there are true believers born of the Spirit in every major branch of Christianity. Yes, in Roman Catholicism, in Orthodoxy, even in the Coptic Church. In fact, I'm actually more gener generous in that regard because you'll have Orthodox and Roman Catholics that will condemn Coptics and Coptics condemning them as heretics. I believe there are true believers in all the major branches of Christianity, especially the historic churches, those that have a pedigree that go back to the apostles. And so that I'm not where I was years ago where I thought, if you're Catholic, ipso facto, you're of the devil. Right? This is what I believe. This is my conviction. This is my understanding. I'm just being open with you and honest with you. Right? If you disagree, that's okay. But please, don't bash me. And don't say, Sam is becoming ecumenical. He's compromised. He's like Billy Graham. You know what I'm saying? He just want to hold hands with everybody and say, who by how? Who by how? Right. right? This is my conviction. And you know what's ironic? Here's what's ironic. You have pre-Vatican II, right? Let's say traditional Catholics, old Latin mass Catholics, who still believe that Protestants are schismatics and they need to turn to the church. You have Orthodox who think that if you're not Orthodox, then you're a heretic or a schismatic. And you have Coptic. So it's ironic that though if I say, if you hear some Protestant attacking Catholics, Catholics get upset. But then you have Catholics who attack Protestants saying they're not true Christians. We have people in every major branch of Christianity that's going to attack anyone and everyone outside of their own fold as being fake Christians, false Christians, right? You get my point? You get what I'm saying? In fact, some of you Catholics already know this. The set of Acantists, right? Set of Acantism. That's a group of Roman Catholics that think the current popes are anti-popes and that Vatican II was an abomination. And they call Catholics and the Pope to repentance, right? Right? So what's my point? It's not just Protestants who think ill of the Catholics. You have those in Catholicism who think ill of Protestants, those in Orthodoxy who think of ill of Catholics and Protestants. And the, it's, it's in every major branch, right? Everyone. And I have said some harsh things and mean things to Roman Catholics in the past, and it's on record, right? But one thing I don't like I'll just tell you one thing right off the bat. Thank you. D this, is my lisp turning you on? Is it causing you to stumble? Are you now struggling with your carnal fleshly desires? You even have a picture of your prophet Muhammad. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not Muhammad. Who is that? Oh, because you had a picture of someone accused of molesting and raping and sexually harassing woman. That perfectly describes Muhammad, the son of Satan. <clears throat> okay. But now coming back to the issue. And admins, if you can quickly bounce people, if they're going to start distractions like they did yesterday. I just want to prepare us for what I'm about to discuss. I'm trying to be as honest as possible to scripture and how the Holy Spirit has worked throughout the history of the church. And when I look at statements of church fathers and i see the things that the holy spirit allowed them to believe i have a hard time saying today that those who believe things that are similar to what the early church believed are false brethren can i give you just one example and please don't attack me you can agree to disagree with me take what i have to say study it and if you see i'm in error reject it and pray the spirit convict me to realize my error and to repent of it right can I give you one example of what I mean? One example that I, and by the way, I haven't come to this position overnight. It's been over what? 
let me say full-time ministry 1999. We're in 2019. What, 30 years? 30 years of agonizing over these issues. 30 years of wrestling with these, excuse me, these issues, right? Okay. Believe it or not, there was one doctrine held unanimously by the early Christians, what I call the early church fathers, from the second century onwards. And this is also reflected, you know where? It's reflected in the Nicene Creed, which even Protestants recite. The Nicene Creed. Okay, believe it, believe it or not. Yes. Now, remember Eric Titrolt. I even said truth will divide, but we have to determine what are the essential truths of Christianity that we all have to agree and cannot compromise, and what are secondary issues. For example, a a Eric Titrolt. Let's take John MacArthur as an example. John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul had a debate on infant baptism versus credo baptism. See, we have another dog of Muhammad who thinks that I'm a coward, even though I called out his boyfriend, Muhammad Nikab. But Muhammad Nikab is all talk and bark. He wanted to use me to make money. I promise you, if Muhammad Nikab were to fight me, he would be seeing your prophet in Ge Jehenna if he tries to attack me. But he won't. He knows better. He knows better. But coming back to the issue in Jesus' name, I don't want to talk about that dog, the dog of Allah. Let's talk about Jesus Christ, our Lord. Muhammad's God and judge and destroyer. Okay? And now, here. <clears throat> Eric, R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur debated on whether infants can be baptized or not. Now, you would say, and they would say, this is a secondary issue. We can agree to disagree. We can debate it, but we're still brothers in Christ. You see my point? But both positions can't be true, right? Both positions can't be true. So here, when John MacArthur tells you truth divides, well, not in the case of baptism because it didn't divide him from R.C. Sproul. He's convinced Sproul is wrong. Sproul was convinced he was wrong. And yet... Both positions can't be true. Only one of them is the truth, but they still agreed to disagree and considered each other brothers. So even that statement needs to be qualified. It's preachy. Truth defined. Okay, that's preachy. So are you now going to divide, MacArthur, are you going to divide over the issue of infant baptism with your Presbyterian brothers? Are you now going to separate from those Christians, those Calvinists who are amill or postmill or hold to theonomy? Because MacArthur doesn't hold that. He'll say no. These are secondary issues. But hold on, John MacArthur. Truth divides, and one of you is wrong, and the other one has the truth. So why aren't you dividing over these issues? You see, it's preachy, isn't it? Folks, it's preachy to say, truth divide, brother. But then when I start getting specific, oh, so you mean, since you're convinced, believer's baptism. So infant baptism is wrong. You're going to divide with R.C. Sproul and President Perry. No, 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 no. But wait, you just said truth divides. Why in this area of truth, it's insignificant or not significant enough for you to divide over? Preachy, yes. Right? Right? So, Dominus, you just agree, right? You believe in credo baptism because it's a sign of the new covenant. And God's blessing is for households, which includes infants. And one of the blessings is administering to infants the sign of the new covenant, which is baptism, right? Okay, but then you have credo baptism, say you're wrong. But that's my point, folks. Who decides which doctrines we need to divide over, which doctrines we can agree to disagree and unite? My conviction here, I'm going to tell you my conviction. You may agree with me. You may disagree. That's okay, folks. Please just don't condemn me. And I know people are going to condemn me. Especially, I know there will be certain reforms. Like, he's compromised. Look what happened. He's, he's on his way to Rome. He's crossing. <laughs> Don't you like when I get animated? Okay, now, here's what I believe. This is my conviction. After many years of agonizing over these issues, and I'm going to give you an example of a, of a belief that was unanimously held by the church fathers, which troubled me for many years. Okay. I believe there are true believers born of the Spirit in all the major branches of Christianity. And I believe some churches have more of the truth than other churches, right? <clears throat> but all churches have significant error and false teaching. 
But I don't believe that if someone goes to the Roman Catholic Church, he or she is necessarily an unbeliever. Or if they go to the Orthodox Church, he or she, or a Coptic Church, or Presb you get my point? No, I'm not. My conviction is that the Bible teaches these two doctrines. And until I'm convinced otherwise, I stand on these two doctrines. Sola fide, sola scriptura. I've heard the best of all sides, and I'm still not convinced that sola fide is not biblical or sola scriptura is not biblical. So this is where I stand. And since, since, since these are uniquely Protestant doctrines, I identify with the Protestant tradition. Because Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Coptic do not affirm sola fide, nor do they affirm sola scriptura. Right? This is my conviction. You don't believe like I believe? That's okay. Just don't condemn me. Now, let me give you a teaching that troubled me for years until I finally just bowed and he said, okay. Okay. Did you know that the early church, I'm in about second century onwards, second century onwards, Christians unanimously held to water baptism being the instrumental means, the instrument that God used to grant regeneration, the gift of spiritual life and forgiveness of sins. Did you know that? This was something that held heretics and orthodox alike. Yes. And you want proof of it? Do you want me to give you proof? Let me give you proof. How many of you affirm the Nicene Creed? How many how many of you know affirm I'm sorry, not no. Affirm the Nicene Creed. You know what the Nicene Creed is? Protestant is here. Good. We're going to start in a minute. Right, let me show you. Yeah. Let me show you. Let me get the creed for you. Nicene Creed. Let's read it. I actually did a session in Chicago, on the Nicene Creed. When I said session, it was multiple sessions. If you guys are interested, I can do a series of teachings breaking down the creed by the grace of the Trinity, if you're interested. Would you like me to do that? You let me know. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. Hold on. I just didn't get the link pro properly. I did. I think over. it took me about... I don't remember. It took me about close to two years to finish it because I keep babbling on. So if you're interested, I can start a series, title it Nicene Creed. And it will be multiple series. It may take me a year to finish where we take each line and break it down to the best of my ability by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now. Okay, here. Here is the link to the Nicene Creed. I'm going to read it for you guys. Okay, but let me give you the link. You can find online. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. Amen? Can you amen that? Amen? Before I move on. Okay. That's the first part. Second part. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Now, here they didn't translate the word monogenes as only begotten. That's fine. Only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Okay, can we amen that? He is begotten of the Father, but he's not created. He's not a creature. And the Father begot him in eternity before the ages. So that Jesus is eternally the Son and eternally begotten. And he's truly God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Amen? Okay. Amen so far. All right. You're going to see why I keep saying amen <clears throat> in a minute. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, I made. Of the same essence as the Father. The Father's nature is his nature is the Spirit's nature. Through him, Jesus, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. Amen? So far we get amens? Anyone disagree? All right. You'll see where I'm going with this. Amen. I love this creed. I swear by this creed because it perfectly sums up, encapsulates what the Bible teaches. So I am an affirmer. Of the Nicene Creed. Okay, now let's continue. We're not done. 
<clears throat> he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge living and dead. His kingdom will never end. Amen. Right? Hallelujah. Amen. Did you notice what it did not say, though? That when he comes to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom never ends, he it does not say the nature, the extent of the judgment. He's going to raise the living and the dead, but it doesn't say whether the damned will be damned forever, everlastingly, or not. It leaves it open in this creed. But I'll get back to that in a minute. Watch here. Okay, now. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. Now, before you amen this, this is what we call the Western version of the Nicene Creed. The Western version of the Nicene Creed. Okay. The original creed didn't have... The original creed, when it was first ratified, written in 325, the Creed of Nicaea, the only thing it had was, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. Period. The rest of that came later. In subsequent councils, the other statements came later. later. And the statement where it says, who proceeds from the Father and Son, originally the creed said, who proceeds from the Father, period. Period. Who proceeds from the Father. It was later... Later, that the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope added, and the Son. So that statement was called the Filioque, Filioque. Not all churches agree, because that's a later addition to the creed. Later addition. So we're going to go with what it originally said. What it originally said, because we all agree on that part. Let me read it again. I'm going to reread it without that. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. Amen? I'm taking the original form of the creed that didn't have and the Son. Can we amen that? The Holy Spirit is the Lord. He is the giver of life. He does proceed from the Father. No church denies that. Who together with the Father and Son is to be worshipped and glorified. And he spoke by the prophets. Hallelujah. Amen? Right? Okay, now, watch. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now, number one, even Catholics will admit this. When it says we believe in one holy Catholic, it doesn't mean Roman Catholic. The word Catholicos means the Church of Christ is universal. It's located all over the world. So it literally means we believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. Amen? Yeah, block the distractions, folks. Please. Universal. Now, why is it called holy? Because the word in Greek and Hebrew, let me, let me explain. The word in Greek and Hebrew means to be set apart. The church is composed of living human beings born of the Spirit of Christ, Set apart from the world, made the possession of Christ. That's what it means to be holy. You're now set apart from the world, set apart from the kingdom of darkness, set apart from belonging to this fallen world, and are made the possession of Christ. So that's why it's holy, the set apart ones. And this body of believers, this body is universal because they're believers in every corner of the earth. And it's apostolic because it was the apostles whom the Holy Spirit sent to build the body of Christ. You understand what the creed is saying here? Eric, you, you, please don't repeat the same thing over and over again. We got it, brother. Okay, now. So far, we amen, right? We are amening. Now, let me skip one line. I'll get back to it. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life of the world to come. Amen. Can we amen that? 
Okay, now, folks, did you see what the creed did? Did you see what the creed did? I just posted it. It left open the duration, the extent, the nature of punishment. The creed does not make it an article of faith to believe in everlasting conscious torment, which is now the traditional view. It left it open. As long as you believe Jesus will return to the earth, resurrect the dead, judge the living and the dead, right? That's good enough for you to be considered a Christian belonging to the body of Christ. Did you catch it? You see it? We post it again. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life in the world to come. Amen. It left open whether the punishment of the damned is forever or whether they'll be wiped out of existence after experiencing punishment for a period of time. They left that open. In other words, they're telling you, here's what you have to work with. You work within this frame, right? Work within the, these parameters, and anything that is not contradictory to these assertions, you can then agree to disagree and debate passionately about them. Mickey Efrata, the creed doesn't say don't believe in punishment. The very fact that it says Jesus will come to Raise the dead and judge the living and dead means that there is <clears throat> judgment involved. But it leaves open the nature of the punishment, the extent of that punishment. You want me? You understand my point? No, I, I'm saying, Adam Seeker, they didn't say that to be a cr true Christian, you have to believe that those in hell will suffer forever or they will suffer for a period of time and be wiped out or even wh whether that they go to hell and suffer in our purge and then made redeemable. They left that open. D Dodge, for you to tell me that I think Mormons are Christians too, that means you're not listening to anything I'm saying and I'm getting very disappointed and upset and I'm thinking about blocking you. Which Mormon or Jehovah Witness can amend the creed as it's defined here? No, 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 no. Purgatory is different, How Stark. In the Catholic understanding, purgatory are for faithful Catholics who need to be purged of temporal. Well, they, they make a distinction between temporal punishments and need to be purged, right? In order to be made completely pure to enter the presence of God. Right? Then just close your eyes and meditate, uh, Ryan. Okay, now, focus, just for the record. Obviously, Mormons are not Christians. Joe's Witnesses are not Christians. Humanitarian Unitarians are not Christians. Oneness Pentecostals are not Christians because they deny the triunity of God, which is taught in Scripture and affirmed in church history. Now, let me qualify that further. You see, you're asking me. So the official teaching of the Mormon church, the official teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses, the official teaching of Unitarians, the official teaching of Oneness Pentecostals, their official teachings are damnable heresies, and if someone affirms those teachings and rejects the biblical basis for the Trinity, he or she is not a brother or sister. I just explained what I thought about oneness. These guys are not listening. You want me there? Now, but let me ask another question. Let me ask another question because I want to go into the meat of the matter. Here's another question I'm going to ask every one of you. All right. What if you have someone who's oneness or a Jehovah's Witness who has no clue what the Trinity actually teaches and has never heard a solid biblical case for the Trinity and a solid refutation of their own teaching? Is that person in the same camp, same category 
as one of their leaders who has studied the overwhelming massive amount of evidence from the scriptures in affirmation of the Trinity and the responses to the objections to the Trinity, and that person still rejects the Trinity. You see the difference? So what I believe is God in his infinite wisdom, mercy, love, compassion, will take that into consideration so it's between that person and God. So I cannot consign that person to hell. You get my point? That's a different individual. In fact, here, I'm going to challenge every one of you. Those of you who come from solid Trinitarian churches, listen to what I'm about to say. Those of you who come from solid Trinitarian churches, how many of your family members, let's say your grandma, your grandpa, even know what the Trinity is and even know about the personal distinctions in the Godhead or know that though Jesus, Son of God, he's also God, that if I ask them question, they won't stumble and get confused over the relationship between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? Whether Catholic, whether Orthodox, whether Coptic, whether Protestant. Okay. So do you consign these people to hell? No, because they're in a different camp. They don't know. They're not rejecting something they know. They're not rejecting anything because they don't know. You see my point? You see the difference? That's why you take it by a case-by-case -case study. Don't generalize. Meet the individual where he or she is at. Take them on their level and be used of the Spirit to teach them and show them the truth. I know Orthodox why. Thank you. Right? Everyone clear? Okay, now. now, why did I go through this creed here? This is the part I skipped for now. This is the part I skipped for now, but now I'm going to bring it up. As the Holy Spirit grants me anointing from his glorious presence, filling me with wisdom and knowledge, filling you with wisdom and knowledge, purifying us in the holy blood of Jesus Christ and sanctifying us to become more like Jesus and saving us from our flesh and having mercy on us when we fail. Transforming us for the glory of Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Take over the session. Save me from error. Save me from sinning, please. Save them, Holy Spirit, and bless them to understand, to become more like Jesus, every one of us, and seal our loved ones. Seal my daughters. Cover them in the blood of Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Take over for the glory of Christ in Jesus' name. Now, this is the part of the creed I didn't mention. We affirm. We affirm. One baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Wow. <laughs> Folks, let me explain the significance of this. Both Orthodox and Heterodox, the heretics, affirmed this part of the creed. What did I do? Okay, let me, I just, I thought I just posted, hold on. What's going on here? Let me get that part again. Let me post it again. Go ahead here. Let me do it again. And did you know this creed is actually accepted by Protestants? In fact, many of you who are Protestants, if you check your Protestant hymnal, you'll find the Nicene Creed there. Did you know that? We affirm, we believe one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And folks, did you know where I get the, got this creed from? What online? What website? Christian Reformed Church. This is a Protestant church. Christian Reformed Church. A Protestant church. So Orthodox Y, do you see what you just did? You're trying to challenge me on the doctrines I believe, even though I did sessions on both, and you want to engage me in debate, which means you're trying to egg me on for a debate. You sure you want to go there? Christian Reform Church. 
They're right there. So here's a Protestant church that amens the Nicene Creed. Okay. Protestants, for the most part, affirm the Nicene Creed. But you understand what it meant historically, what it meant historically to say, we believe, we affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. No, yes, you do believe that as a Protestant, love and light. You do believe that. Every one of you believe baptism is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. You do. Do you want me to explain to you, Protestants, that you do? Thank you, JC Saves. If you're not baptized by the Spirit into Christ, you don't belong to Christ. What's wrong with you guys? There is a baptism that you must experience for you to be forgiven. And if you're not baptized, then you're not forgiven. When the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ, when you are immersed in the Spirit's presence and the Spirit then unites you to Christ, making you one with Christ in the Spirit, otherwise you don't belong to Christ and you're not forgiven. But historically, let me get back to the historical significance of this statement. Historically, what they meant was God used water baptism as the instrument through which the Holy Spirit would regenerate you and forgive you. So they did mean water baptism. But do you see God's providence? Why I can affirm it? Thank you, Emma Circuit. Thank you. You answered the question. I was going to say, there are solid Seventh-day Adventists that are Trinitarian, who believe in the Scripture, and they believe they're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, though there are areas we may disagree, like Emma believes in soul sleep and believes in annihilationism, which is now being embraced by many evangelical Christians. That's a lie, Stephen Martin. Now, Stephen, if you're a Mohammedan and you're ashamed to admit you're a Mohammedan, shame on you. But I don't blame you because I'm ashamed of Muhammad too. If you're going to be honest and tell me you're Muhammad, then I'll answer Matthew 15, 24 to show you you have no clue what you're talking about. People will tell you, Broston, that the old covenant sign and seal of your righteousness was circumcision. Thank you, Paul Anker. I love you. I want to kiss your head. Notice the providence of God that when they did write, we affirm one baptism for forgiveness of sins, they left out the word water, even though they meant water baptism. But I take this as God allowing them not to include that part of water so that like someone like me, I can affirm it. You get it? Now, if you guys are patient and you're going to listen attentively, I'm going to show you where the Bible says there is a baptism that saves you. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13, verse 13 specifically. Watch. But please, focus, no side tangents, no debates. Guys, read with me. For as the body is one, and hath many members. See, one body, the spiritual body of Christ. Okay. And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now notice, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. There you go. One spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all and have been all made to drink unto one spirit. Wow. So you are forgiven of your sins by baptism. You need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ because the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ, meaning he immerses you into Christ. He unites you to Christ, makes you one with Christ. And once you're one with Christ, you are forgiven. <whistles> Romans chapter 8, verse 9. I will read 10 as well. Romans 8, verses 9 to 10. Emma, you don't need to defend yourself, sister. You're welcome. You're going to disagree with some of the teachings I have because I don't believe in soul sleep. But please agree to disagree with me and don't condemn me and beat me up. Romans 8, verses 9 to 10. 
But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. See, in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You catch it? You don't have the spirit of Christ. You don't belong to Christ. You remain in your sins. You are condemned. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Sin in my flesh makes me mortal. I'm going to end up dying. But the time will come where this body that's mortal will be made immortal. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay. You catch it? So there's none of you here that cannot amen that creed. Even those of you who don't believe that water baptism is the means by which God confers forgiveness of sins, you still believe baptism saves you, right? And just for the record, the Roman Catholic Orthodox Coptic tradition and Nestorian churches do not believe it's water baptism in of itself. What they believe is that act of water baptism is the means to the grace of being given the Holy Spirit to be made alive and forgiven. So they're not saying it's water baptism in of itself. This is the means that God has decreed for the person to receive the Holy Spirit, to be made alive, united to Christ, and forgiven. Am I right, Roman Catholics and Orthodox and Coptics? So understand what I'm saying. Not a who's an Orthodox, okay, everyone else. They're telling you, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe the Holy Spirit has to baptize us in Christ. But we believe that the Holy Spirit is given to us through water baptism. You catch it? So nobody denies that you need to be baptized by the Spirit into Christ to be saved. Nobody denies that. If you deny it, you don't follow the Bible. You get it? But there are traditions that say the Holy Spirit is given at water baptism. So no, none of them, no one is that dumb enough to say water baptism saves you. They'll say, no, this is a means of saving grace. That in the act of water baptism, when we're obedient to that act, the Holy Spirit is then given to us <clears throat> through that act of baptism where now we are united to Christ, one with Christ, and are forgiven of our sins. Right? Because they believe that you can confer saving grace to a child apart from the child's faith because God will honor the faith of the parents in doing that for the child to give the child the gift of regeneration, because again, don't forget, we are born with a sinful nature. Our nature is tainted by sin, which makes it inevitable for us to sin. So we need our natures to be made alive by the Spirit. So they'll say that you can confer that blessing to an infant, and God will honor that, and then... You raise the child to walk in that confession, but if that child turns, chooses to walk away, then that child can lose that gift of regeneration. That's what they believe. Now, the Presbyterians here, like Dominus, do not believe water baptism is the instrumental means of regeneration. So they'll tell you, we baptize our infants <clears throat> In order to recognize that they are part of the new covenant community. Just like in the Old Testament, Israelites were required to circumcise male infants eight days old in order for them to be part of the old covenant community. In the new covenant community, <clears throat> infants are baptized to be included in the new covenant community and blessings without this meaning that they're regenerated. Anymore, when a male infant eight days old was circumcised, he was regenerated. Dominus, am I right? Exactly, Angela. You got it. They'll say, no, that child who was born with that sinful nature and tendency is now made alive in the spirit irrespective of 
his or her faith. But adults who've never been baptized, adults who are coming from, from another tradition, they need to repent, believe, and be baptized. Well, see, again, I'm not trying to get into this issue now, but real quickly. Those who believe in infant baptism will tell you that once you've been baptized as an infant, you don't need to get baptized a second time. But credo Baptists, those who believe that the only baptism that God accepts is a believer's baptism, someone who makes a profession of faith, turns to Christ, then he gets baptized. That's the only baptism God accepts will tell you you have to be rebaptized. What do you think the controversy was among the Protestants with the Anabaptists? And sadly, you had the magisterial reformers like Luther who would actually kill Anabaptists because Anabaptists, Anabaptists means to baptize again. That's where some of these Baptists come from. Like my brother, 1611, who's going to heaven. Anabaptists. You with me there? The Anabaptists would baptize again because they didn't believe that their infant baptism was accepted by God. So here, Jason, if your conviction was my infant baptism didn't count because I had to believe and repent and you got baptized again, then that's between you and the Lord. I'm not trying to be politically correct and a crowd pleaser. But if you felt but if you felt that your infant baptism, like I said, was of no use, then you had to get baptized again. But if you felt it was acceptable to God, then why did you get baptized a second time? You get my point? If you believe that your baptism as an infant was accepted to God, and later you came to saving faith in Christ, and you believe that the baptism as an infant, God will accept and credit to you, then no need to get baptized again. But if you believe that God doesn't accept infant baptism, he only accepts baptism when you believe and repent, then yes, it was smart for you to get baptized again. And just for the record, my position is I'm a credo Baptist. I believe that a person has to believe and repent for that baptism to be acceptable, which is why I got baptized again. No, Adam Seeker, it's not I'm trying to defend both points. I just told you what my position is. For me to, in, to discuss this, it's not going to take me five minutes because, Adam Seeker, you have not just Catholics and Orthodox. You have sharp Protestants, sharp Presbyterian ministers, who will argue tooth and nail from Scripture that baptism includes even infants because the Bible speaks of household baptisms. And do you think I'm going to settle it in five minutes? I just mentioned a debate between John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul. Listen to it. R.C. Sproul believed in infant baptism. John MacArthur, like me, believes in believer's baptism, what's called credo, confessional baptism. They debated it. Those who believe in infant baptism believe that R.C. Sproul schooled John MacArthur. Those who believe in credo baptism believe John MacArthur schooled R.C. Sproul. You get it? Don't look to me to solve these debates. I am not that smart, and I'm not God's gift to the church to bring perfect unity. Far from it. So even if I give you my position, you can just Google the opposing position and hear someone else make a much more forceful case than, than the one I made. You get my point? But my conviction, my belief, is that a, a person believes and repents and then gets baptized. Exactly, take, take maps. You just repeated what I said. But infant baptism is not unique to Roman Catholics, to Orthodox, to Coptics. There are Protestants who believe in infant baptism. John Calvin believed in infant baptism, and he believed it was a sign and seal of the new covenant. So did Martin Luther. And then again, I don't want to misrepresent him, but I believe, and I think I'm correct, don't Lutherans believe not only in infant baptism, but also in water baptismal regeneration? Methodists do too. Right? But the ones who said they came from Catholicism, 
Orthodox Coptics, Nestorians, they don't come from Roman Catholicism, and they too believe in infant baptism. Do you know why? Do you know why these churches that trace themselves back to the apostles believe in infant baptism? Do you know why? Because at the start of the end of the second century, infant baptism became the norm. Folks, understand what I just said. From the start of the end of the second century, we have evidence that they started baptizing infants. And then this became the widespread spread dominant position of the church. Okay, can I ask you guys a question? Folks, please answer me sincerely and honestly. You're going to see why I came to this conviction, why I came to this conclusion, why I've been agonizing over these issues for 30 years. Okay, listen to me. Folks, listen to me. Okay. Since infant baptism became the dominant widespread tradition from, let's say, the latter part of the second century, even up until now, or let's go at least up to the time of the reformers, do you actually believe, do you actually believe the Lord Jesus, who is faithful to preserve his church, to preserve his church, and to make his, sure that his church doesn't fall into damnable heresy. Notice what I said. False teaching that will damn them to hell. Do you actually believe that Jesus would allow the church to accept such a practice, allowing it to become the dominant widespread position, if it was damnable and so false that it would sever them from Christ? Okay, Wiser Green, I am an historian. I am from the Church of the East. But people don't know what the Church of the East is. No, right? You folks, you know what you just admitted? Then you admitted that God is okay with infant baptism. He allows it. Even though you may believe he didn't teach it, he permits it, and he doesn't consider it damnable. You got it? You see what my struggle, my agony has been for 30 years? Exactly, Jason, 123. Jason, you see my struggle now, right? One, two, three. J7, if you want to get blocked... Do make a comment that we're not baptized in water when I will show you passages where Jesus' apostles and Jesus himself baptized people in water. J17. Do you want me to show you that Jesus himself baptized people in water? You see, Jason, my struggle? What do I do with the early church and church history? And what do I do with the fact that God allowed these doctrines that people consider damnable? Okay, let me give you another doctrine. You guys want me to trouble you, right? You come to my sessions to be challenged, to be troubled, to think more deeply, right? Joseph, I cannot be a Roman Catholic because there's too many teachings that I consider false, such as the, the, the papacy. No disrespect to you. I can't accept it. Okay. Guys, let me give you another one. We have evidence from the 3rd century onwards that the intercession of the mother of our Lord was something done and carried out by Christians of various denominations. And that too became a widespread dominant position from at least the third century all the way up until the Reformation. So can I ask you a question again? I ask you a question again. Please answer honestly. Don't condemn me. I already did a six-part series on communion of saints. I'm shaking, Hassan, like Muhammad shook in his boots when Jesus crushed him under his feet and damned him to hell. Okay, here. <clears throat> Listen to me. If the intercession of glorified believers in heaven, specifically the mother of our Lord, is a damnable practice, are you saying Christ allowed this damnable practice 
to become widespread and dominant and did nothing to save his church from a teaching that damned them to hell. Let me rephrase the question. Let me rephrase the question. Okay, let me rephrase the question. Do you think Jesus would allow the church? I'm not talking about a fringe group. This became the dominant position of all the various factions of Christianity. Allow the members of the body of Christ, or just say church, because you, let's say they're not members, to embrace a belief that saints in heaven, angels in heaven, can be petitioned to pray for them on, our, on earth. If that belief was damnable, do you think the Lord would allow them to then embrace such a belief and do nothing to preserve his church? Okay, now, you see what you just did. You just admitted, and this is my path, by the way. Folks, listen to my path. Yeah, block Hassan, the son of Satan. This is my path. You just admitted this is not a damnable teaching. Otherwise, Jesus would have preserved this church because Jesus cannot fail, will not fail. He's with the church to preserve it. Buffering. Okay, buffering. Okay, let me say it again. You just admit that communion of saints cannot be a damnable doctrine because Jesus allowed this doctrine to become the dominant teaching belief of the Christians as a whole, universally. And we know Jesus is with his church to protect his church and will not allow his church to believe something that will damn them and sever them from Christ. Right? So now notice what you're agreeing. Infant baptism, even the belief of infant baptismal regeneration, communion saints cannot be damnable teachings Otherwise, the Lord allowed the church universal to embrace damnable teachings and did nothing to preserve his church until the Reformation. Everyone with me? Everyone got it? MP, you're not listening. Whatever that remnant was, it disappeared because <clears throat> all the major branches of Christianity believe these doctrines. So if you want to come up with some fantasy remnant that we have no evidence for, more power to you. You can live in fantasy land. See, this is what people have to do if they don't want to deal with church history. Well, there was some remnant out there, maybe in the Himalaya. Nobody knows them. Nobody... So you're saying... That the Lord allowed the heretics to become the dominant voice, drowning out the remnant that nobody knows, nobody heard of. But they were there somewhere. So then how did Jesus build his church? And why is it that the schismatics and heretics became the dominant voice? No, but they were there. You know, there were the Valdens, some of there, over there, you know, out way there in the sticks. And they didn't impact anybody. So the one that meant impacting people that guided the church theologically were these heretics. Come on, really? That fantasy story I embraced as well early on because I didn't know how to get around this uh, these arguments. I too believed in that fantasy story, right? Because folks, whether you believe it or not, all the major branches of Christianity today have been impacted, influenced, affected by the church fathers not some remnant out there no one has heard of whose writings we don't have. You've been impacted by those men whose writings are still with us today, preserved. Okay, you want me to drop some names? Irenaeus, right? Polycarp, Ignatius, <clears throat> Justin Martyr, Athanasius, Alexander, on and on and on goes. So be honest to Scripture, honest to Christ, honest to history, and simply say this. This is my position. Simply say this. These doctrines cannot be damnable and heretical because if they were, 
then I'm going to have to agree with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. The church of Jesus Christ disappeared and was lost in the second century. And then Jesus had to either raise up Joseph Smith or Charles Taze Russell or someone else to restore the church. So there was no church from at least the second century onwards. Sixteen eleven. most Protestants also reject eternal security on an individual level. It's not unique to Catholicism. That's the whole point. It's not unique to Catholicism. In fact, 1611, you and I are the odd men out. You and me believe in what's called eternal security or perseverance of the saints, that if you're truly born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will preserve you and make sure you never turn away and are severed from Christ. So if you turn away, it will be for a season. It will convict you and bring you back to Christ. Most churches believe that if you have the free will to accept Christ, you have the free will to walk away. And God will honor your free will. You with me there? Yeah, but Bill Thompson, we persevere because he preserves us by his almighty power. But then they'll say, yes, God will preserve you perfectly insofar that you want to remain in Christ. But if you of your own choice turn away, God will honor your free will and let you walk away. You get my point? Folks, was this a little challenging? Right? Educational? Edifying, because I wanted to challenge you to think more deeply, because I do want to talk about a topic. I may do more than one live, live stream. Dodge, let's not go into the past. Give people the chance to grow and understand and correct and repent. I told you early on, I used to bash Catholics and calling it the great whore of Babylon, because that was the tradition I was raised in. But like I said, Dodge, you have Catholics that bash other Catholics and Protestants saying that they're heretics and schismatics. We have people in every major branch of Christianity that will view others as false. Let's not go too far. Oh, you Calvinists here, you Reformed Christians, put a one. If you're a Calvinist, a Reformed Christian. Why would I pray for Jesus? Jesus is the one who prays for me. He doesn't need my prayers. Okay. For you Calvinist Reformed Christian, are there not Reformed Calvinists who will tell you that Calvinism is the gospel and the Arminian gospel, the gospel held by those who hold to Arminianism, is a false gospel like Catholicism and they're not brothers and sisters in Christ? Don't you have those nuts among your camp as well? You catch it now? Every major branch of Christianity has their nuts. Those who think you got to believe exactly. And you know what's ironic? Here's what's funny. It just so happens that they hold the true doctrines and everyone else who doesn't are on their way to hell. It never dawns on them that there's a possibility they're holding to false beliefs. And by their own standards, they're going to hell. You get it? Isn't it coincidental that those who say they have a false gospel going to hell just so happen to have the right gospel? Wow, what a coincidence. Can it be possible you preaching a false gospel and you're going to hell? No, of course not. I have the true understanding. I understand the Bible. You don't understand like me? You're going to hell, son. Now, folks, do me a favor. Don't turn this into a debate about communion of the saints. I did a six-part series on the, my YouTube channel. Look for it. Study the arguments. And if you agree or if you agree to disagree, fine. Don't turn this into a debate. About, I'm just asking you to think about it historically. Historically. Here's another doctrine I want you to think about. Here's another doctrine I want you to think about. You ready? One more doctrine I want you to meditate on. I already did medic in previous sessions, but I'll bring it up again. 
And so I can go into the Son of God. I may have to stop this and start a second live stream. We'll do a, maybe. Let's see. Okay, pay attention, folks. Pay attention. In the early centuries of Christianity, you will find three three positions, but one of those positions became the dominant position and the widespread position to the point that I've been told. So, again, I haven't read it for myself, but I've read people citing snippets. I've been told, and correct me if I'm wrong, folks. I don't want to give you misinformation. I've been told that Martin Luther and John Calvin held to the perpetual virginity of Mary. Right? I have seen snippets from Martin Luther saying that Mary was a perpetual virgin, and I've been told that even Calvin believed that. But again, that's what I've been told. That too would be the influence of their tradition. But here, there were three views in the early centuries of Christianity, one of which became dominant, the other two vanished. Well, let, let me, not the other two, I shouldn't say other two. Okay. When it comes to Jesus and his brothers, there's the view that they are brothers from Joseph's previous wife. There's a tradition that said Joseph was married, had children, his wife died, and he was up in age when he took Mary and didn't marry her, consummate marriage with her, but acted as a guardian of sorts. And so those brothers were actually Joseph's sons from a previous woman. Okay? It's one. The second view, the second view is these are Jesus' cousins. They're called brothers because of their close unity, because they're pretty much raised in the same household, but they were not uterine brothers from the same mother, but cousins. Okay? Now understand that these two positions both presuppose the perpetual virginity of Mary, right? These two positions are basically stating that Mary remained a virgin after she gave birth to Christ and was taken as a physical virgin, right? The third position, which is a position of Helvidius, as well as Tertullian, some don't recognize Tertullian. They say that he became an apostate later on because of the... Mont Montanist, Montanist heresy, even though he's solid Trinitarian, that these are brothers from Mary, that Joseph and Mary consummated the marriage and she gave birth to Jesus' uterine brothers after Jesus was born. Folks, two out of three positions presuppose the perpetual virginity of Mary. Guess what position became dominant? The dominant position early on was that Mary remained a perpetual virgin, right? That was the dominant position to the point it even influenced Muhammad and the Quran. They'll tell you yes, because when it says your mother and brothers are outside, Surat at Spore, he's going to respond in the same manner that he was asked the question or in the same manner that the statement was given. Did the man say your mother and cousins are outside? No, your mother and brothers. Why? Because they were called his brothers because of their close union, because they were raised in the same household, and so they were closer than relatives. They were just as close as actual brothers. So if someone says to me, your mother and brothers are outside, it doesn't make sense if I say, who are my mother and cousins? He's responding to what the person stated to him. You with me there? Serrated spork? I'm just telling you that's the response, right? Are you with me there, Serrated spork? Now, this position of Mary's perpetual virginity became so dominant, widespread, that even Muhammad taught Mary's perpetual virginity. Did you know that? Mary's perpetual virginity is an article of faith in Islam. Muslims call her El Batul, the virgin. Muslims believe that Mary remained a virgin throughout her entire life and was taken to Jannah as a virgin. Where do you think Muhammad got that teaching from? Where do you think Muhammad got that teaching from? 
No, he didn't get it from God. He's not, he's not a prophet. He got it from the church. He got it from the Christians. Now, folks, what does that tell you? It tells you early on the dominant position and the widespread teaching was that Mary was a perpetual virgin. And now let me tell you the significance. I want you to think. I'm going to start another live stream if you guys want. Okay? I want you to think. We know that by the 5th century, the 400s, the Church of the East Historian Church was ostracized by the church at large, what we call the Byzantine Church. We know the Coptics also broke off. So by the 5th century, Orthodox Roman Catholics, the Byzantine Church, considered Coptics, Miophysites, right, and the Nestorian Church, the Church of the East, as heretics, so they all split. And guess what, folks? Even though they split in the 5th century, all of these churches believe in common the perpetual virginity of Mary, infant baptismal regeneration, and the communion of saints. You know what that tells you? These beliefs have to predate the schism and the splitting of these groups. Daryl, do you want me to block you and send you on your merry way for keeping retorting false and being stupid enough to keep saying false, false? Can you stop? If you came in the middle of the conversation, don't chime in. Go back and listen to see why I'm saying these things. Stop if you want to learn, if you don't want to cause problems. Come on. False, false. And you put it in capitals three times. False, false, false. As if we couldn't read. J17, don't tell people what to do in my... my... J17, you got 10 seconds to say sorry to Russo or I'm going to block you. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Send J17 out of here. I don't want this person here anymore. Eh? Please. Okay. Now, coming back to the issue, folks. The Coptic Church and Orthodox and Catholics, you can confirm. The Coptic Church, the Nestorian Church, meaning the Church of the East, broke off for the most part were ostracized, ostracized in the 5th century, around 400s, maybe shortly after that. Am I right? Roman Catholics, Orthodox in the chat? Right? Okay, now, and yet, pay attention, folks, 400s. You said not really. Okay, explain to me. So the Coptics, you didn't condemn them as heretics for holding to Miophysitism, that Christ has one nature, Around the 5th century, started the 6th century. Nada, hold on. Nada said not really. Let's see. Everyone else says I'm correct. She goes not really. Hold on. I just want to, just want to see why she said that. What's not really? See, and David Ayad, he agreed. Thank you, David, for being here because I'm going to use you as well. Sirocco, monophysitism is true. Miophysit, that's the debate, isn't it? Orthodox, he was accused of being a heretic. Don't Let's not get into it. Nestorius wasn't. He believed that Christ was one person with two natures. He was falsely accused for something he didn't believe. But that's not the point. Pay attention here. Okay, Coptics, David Yad and Rocco, you believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, right? That's the teaching of your church. And see, Slam Scammer says, I am Catholic and Sam is right. Right? So you Coptics. The Coptic Church teaches Mary is a perpetual virgin, right? Okay. Yep. Coptic over here as well. She said yes. Coptics, you believe in communion of saints. That the saints in heaven can pray for us and we can ask for their intercession, right? Rocco says, yes, I'm right. Thank you, guys. Right? Okay. Coptics and the story in the Church of the East also. You believe in infant baptism, baptismal regeneration, that you can baptize infants, and in that act of baptism, the Spirit is given to them, they're forgiven, right? Okay. Now, guys, did you see the Coptic Church, the Nestorian Church, Orthodox Roman Catholic Church? These churches were divided by the 5th century no later in the 6th century, 400s, 500s. They split. They were not in communion. 
yet they all agree on these doctrines. Perpetual virginity of Mary, infant baptism, baptism infant <clears throat> baptismal regeneration, communion of saints. Here's the question I want you guys to answer. If these churches that split and were no longer in communion in the 5th century onwards hold to these doctrines in common and also in priests, they also believe in priests, an office of priesthood, that means these doctrines must have been taught before the split, right? Before they divided, right? Yeah. Wiser, khali olubu wiser. The people don't understand what the Assyrian Church of the East is. They're going to say Orthodox. I know it's the Assyrian Church of the East, but for the Westerners, they call it Nestorian Church. Even if I say the Assyrian Church of the East, they're going to think, oh, okay, or Catholic Orthodox. Stop being so wise. Wiser. Allahu Akbar. Okay. So now, for the rest of you guys, the rest of you guys, isn't this proof that these doctrines, communion of saints, perpetual virginity of Mary, infant baptismal hydration, must have been taught before they split? Believe me, I'll debate you and bury Muhammad deeper in hell, that slime, that filth of Satan. And I'm going to make you run right now. So now you know what you just said? These doctrines are very ancient, very old, and became so widespread. Understand, folks, became so widespread, so widespread, that even these churches that split in the 5th century <clears throat> could not get away from these beliefs because these beliefs were anchored in them before the split, before the schism, and was the dominant belief of all Christians the world over up until even the Reformation. So here's my question. If you believe the perpetual virginity of Mary is a damnable teaching, if you believe communion saints is a damnable teaching, infant baptismal regeneration, damnable teaching, then are you saying that Jesus allowed the church universal to embrace damnable teaching, damning themselves to hell, and did nothing to stop it? Orthodox, why? Who are you talking to? Don and me? Yeah. Or are these doctrines that are not damnable, will not cut you off from Christ and damn you to hell, and so God permits these doctrines to be believed? And I'm talking about those who don't believe those doctrines. Do you see what my journey has been for 30 years and my, my agony? How do I deal with the fact that these doctrines were embraced early on and became widespread and dominant if they're so damnable and will land someone in hell? So I changed my position. No, not I didn't even say anything about the Orthodox Church that for you to deny. You say, not really. What did I say about the Orthodox Church was wrong? I said... That the Orthodox Church believes in infant baptismal regeneration, the perpetual virginity of Mary, and communion of saints. So where do you say the general synopsis? Where was I specifically wrong? Because he said, not really. Not really what? And did not the Orthodox Church with the Roman Catholic Church, because you were one until the Great Schism, 1054, ostracize the Coptics called the Miophysites and the Nestorians, the Assyrian Church of the East. There, I said it. Yeah, zero one. Nestorian was a term <clears throat> given to Christians who followed the view of Bishop Nestorius in the fifth century, who said that we shouldn't call Mary the mother of God, we should call her the mother of Christ. Theotokos or Theotokos versus Christotokos. Christotokos. Okay. And so a council was convened in 431 AD, the Council of Eph Ephesus. And by the way, I'm no scholar of church history. I learned from those who are scholars, who then 
condemned anyone who'd refuse to call Mary the mother of God. So the Christians, who were predominantly my ancestors, the Assyrians, went with the view of Nestorius that it's better to call her the mother of Christ. So they were condemned, condemned as heretics. So whenever you hear the word Nestorian used in the Western church, it is a bad word. It refers to heretics from their perspective. But just to let you know, yes, I'm Assyrian, Ashuri. Proud to be what Jesus made me to be. Notice what I said. I am proud to be what Jesus made me to be. He made me a Jilu from Assyria, an Assyrian. So I'm proud to be what Jesus made me to be. If he made you Greek, be proud to be what Jesus made you to be. He made you Greek. Honor him in your ethnicity. You want me there? And to prove to you, to prove to you that Nestorians do not think that there are two persons, a divine Christ and a human Jesus, because that's what they were falsely accused of, separating Christ into two persons. That the Assyrian church has always maintained Christ is one person with two natures in agreement with all Christians. The Coptics, now here's where it's going to get tricky, and I'm going to explain in a minute. And the Coptics are going to actually agree with me. Okay. In 1994, do a Google search. 1994, the then patriarch of the Church of the East, Mardimcha IV, met with the then Pope, Pope John Paul, and there are pictures of it on, on the web where they wrote a crystal, Christological confession uh, agreeing that both churches have always believed the same thing about Jesus, showing that this accusation against the Assyrian church was a false accusation. It was more political than it was an actual fact. Do you know that? Everyone with me there? Thank you, Chun Han Cheng. I like your name. And as you can see, by the way, Chun Han Cheng, I got a Bruce Lee shirt on. Man, I love Bruce. If they call me the Bruce Lee of apologetics, then, man, that's an honor. Okay, anyway. Okay, now, you have here people who are miophysites or monophysites, such as my dear brother here who said he's Eastern Orthodox. Was it David? All right, and David Iyad, he's Coptic. Okay, now, the Coptics believe a doctrine called miophysitism. Mia is the Greek word for one, and phusis, the Greek word for nature. They do not speak of Christ having two natures, a divine and human one. Now, on the surface level, you're going to think that they're denying that Jesus is a man in heaven, that he has a physical body in heaven. No, they don't deny that. Those of you who hold to miophysitism, Am I wrong in saying that you believe that Jesus has a glorified physical body that's immortal and that he's a man in heaven? Just want to make sure I'm not misrepresenting you. Just want to make sure. Anyone here? Maybe I'm wrong. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Yeah, I know, Sally Christian, just like you can take me on. So David Iyad said, that's right. Did you catch it? So if you ask someone who believes in miophysitism, if you ask, uh, believe in miophysitism, does Jesus have a physical body that's glorified, immortalized? Yes. Is he still a man? Yes. So then why do you speak the, of Christ having one nature? Now, again, I want them to correct me because I'm not a scholar of all traditions. I'm not even a scholar, period. Okay. Not a scholar, period. They'll tell you because the human nature of Christ has experienced deification. What the early church called theosis, which Orthodox believe. His humanity <clears throat> has become divine in the sense that it is morally incorruptible and it is physically immortal. So they prefer to speak of the one nature of Christ because his humanity right, has been taken into his divinity without this implying that he's not a man with a physical body. 
You get it? Roko, you're the Eastern Orthodox. Am I correct or am I wrong? Because you believe in miaphysitism, what you called monophysitism. Say that five times fast. Am I a Christ? <laughs> Man, well, I'm anointed by the Spirit like we all are. Okay? So at the end of the day, did you notice that even the miaphysites believe Jesus has a physical body. He's a glorified man in heaven. So when you see Jesus, he still has a physical body. He has a glorified physical body. He's a glorified man. So you will see at the end of the day, we still believe he's the God man. See, Orthodox why? But notice, Orthodox why? When you said they became one in union, that means two things are being united, right? So Orthodox why? You still believe Jesus is a glorified man with a glorified physical body, right? Orthodox why? Just want to make sure, please, Coptics, chime in if I'm wrong. Yeah, I know. Help me help you, man. Let me know if I'm wrong. Sorry for delay. I just want to get there. Okay. The cop. What, Jason, you're Coptic? I don't know if you're Coptic. I thought you were someone else. Oh, Islam, one wheel. I'm tired. Okay, David Yad said spot on. Zero one says sounds right, I would say. All right, good. Thank you, guys. All right. And Jason says I'm a cop to fail one. Okay. All right, good. All right. I, what's the point, folks? I'm sorry for tiring you out, and I hope I'm not boring you. I hope you understood. Yeah, diaphysitism. Okay, so yeah, then that means two natures. I'm sorry, Roko. I thought you're the one who said you're Eastern Orthodox and you believe in monophysitism. Diaphysitism is that Christ is one person, two natures, that though are in union, they haven't been infused with each other. No, Orthodox, yeah, but you didn't answer my question. Orthodox, please answer my question directly so we can ch cut to the chase. Okay. Orthodox, why? You still believe, though, that the two natures are united as one. Christ is still a man, a glorified man with a glorified physical body, right? Does Orthodox Y answer questions? I'm just curious. Let's see. And he's wondering if we pay attention. The, can Orthodox Y, can you hear me? You're tiring me out, friend. Yeah. <laughs> Watch what I'll do to hijab. I'll put a niqab on him and your prophet. Admins, quickly, in muzzling Muhammad's dogs. Okay, so Orthodox, you see? Did you guys hear Orthodox Y just said yes? So, yes, Jesus is a glorified man with a glorified physical body in heaven, right? No, not was. Now in heaven, Orthodox. Maybe my English is not clear. I'm going to give you a final chance. In heaven, you believe Christ has a glorified physical body. He's a glorified man, even though human nature has become one with his divine nature, right? Why is Orthodox why having our time answering questions directly? I know everyone accuses the other of being heretics, PM. Everybody and his mother. Everybody and his mother accuses everyone being heretics. Uh, stupid Naim K, I accepted his challenge. The filthy coward is afraid to debate me. So he's making an excuse that he says, I don't want to fight him. Not only will I fight him, I will decimate him and your prophet. So stop your stupidity. He's a coward. He knows it. And believe me, if he's standing in my face, he won't talk tough. I promise you. He's tough behind a computer screen. Okay, so Orthodox Y, Orthodox Y is in another planet, guys. Sorry, Orthodox Y is looking for W, X, and Z, another planet. Notice Orthodox Y can't answer questions directly. Okay, so now let me come back. Let me come back to the issue. What was the issue? The issue is, in my journey, yeah. See, Orthodox Y, you're going to get one more chance to answer my question directly. I'm going to block you. I'm tired of you now. I just asked you five times. I'm going to ask you again, Orthodox Y. Answer my question directly. Do you believe Christ in heaven is a glorified man with a glorified physical body? Stop telling me two natures became one. I heard you the first 10,000 times. 
Why are you disrespecting me if you're a Christian? Can't you answer directly? Let's see if he's going to answer directly. I know I have a delay. I've been giving you time, but 10 minutes later, you're still repeating the same thing. What's two natures? They're one. What? Okay, we got it. Okay. Switzerland. You know, I'm Switzerland. I'm here for peace. And you still didn't answer the question. Do you notice it? Still didn't answer the question. Can you answer the question, please? He does know the answer. He's He's been telling us what he believes. Jesus is the only Savior. He just said he, what his church believes. So why is it hard to answer? If he doesn't know, he'll say, I don't know. Eskinder, I'm going to block you and muzzle your mommy for giving birth to a doggy. Okay. I'm going to count 20. 20. 19. 18. 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Orthodox, you're going to get blocked. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Answer the question, Orthodox, because the block button is coming. It's Christ, a glorified man with a glorified physical body. You're getting blocked. Okay. Okay, uh, admins, get ready. When I tell you to send Orthodox Y to look for Z. What? Where did he answer? King of Kings, where? Where did he answer? I didn't see the answer. Yes? Okay, good. Orthodox, you, you saved yourself. We are the champions, my friend. And we'll keep on fighting. I can't do that high pitch. We are the champions. We are. So I can't do that. That I can't do. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. It ain't over until the fat boy sings. Ain't over until the fat. He saved himself. That's right. It's a shame way you go with my heart. It's a shame the way you hurt me. Okay, finally, the dude answered. You want me to do that? Uh, was it Pavarotti again? One more time. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Come on. It ain't over until the fat Jilu sings. Thief in the night, we're going to send you into the daytime. Block the thucker. Block thief in the night. Send him in the daytime where you can't be a thief. No, Honestly, guys, is my voice good or what? I just can't do uh, Freddie Mercury. Okay, folks. Okay, well, Riaz, your wish is my command. But when you act out of line... I'm going to end up blocking you too, but here. Okay. But now, folks, did you see what Orthodox Y said? Get what he just said. Okay. Get what he said. We believe the two natures became one in union. But he says, we still believe Christ is a glorified man with a glorified physical body. Now, can I ask you guys a question? How different is that from those who believe that Christ has two natures, one person? Divine and human, and he's a glorified man with a glorified physical body. Right? You see? If he just told you he's a miophysite, the two natures became one, is human and divine, but Jesus is still a man, a glorified man with a glorified physical body. So he can say it's still one nature, but at the end of the day, he still believes Christ is human, is a man with a glorified physical body. You catch it? You caught it? Do you now see why I hesitate to say that these brothers and sisters are heretics? Because he's telling me, no, Jesus is a man in heaven. He's a glorified man with a glorified physical body. But the two natures have become one. Because he believes the humanity of Christ has been deified. What I said yesterday is called theosis, which is the destiny of all of us. 
Okay, so you basically believe he's the God man. No, you don't like to say two natures. At the end of the day, that's what you're, yeah. So then the point of today's session, I'm going to do another session. I'm going to stop this one and start a second one, if you guys want. So we can go into what does it mean to be a son of God? Continue the discussion from yesterday. Because I have time to do a second session. If you guys are interested, because we had about 250 today, and I'm blessed. Thank you, Jesus. May more come for your glory. Sincere people want to sincerely learn and grant me the grace to be gracious and patient with them. But sometimes I don't have to scare you, scare to block you to make you move fast, right? See, it work, right? Come on, Orthodox. You're about to get blocked. Yes, yes. Please, please, don't, please. Yeah, don't, don't block me. <laughs> no matter what you do. I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Right. Okay, now coming back. Let's sum up this session. Let's sum up this session. Okay. Here's how we're going to sum up this session. In my 30 years journeying with Christ, and I pray I remain with Jesus. By the blood of Jesus covering me and my household, my daughters, and the Spirit sealing me, sealing all of us to never turn away from Jesus. I have changed because I have struggled and I have agonized over how the Lord Jesus watched over his church, preserved his church throughout the centuries. And folks, as the Nicene Creed showed, the dominant church, not the heretics, the Orthodox believers, those who represented the truth, fought for the truth, lived the truth, and died for the truth. Men like Athanasius or Alexander of Alexandria. <clears throat> uh, well, some don't consider Tertullian because, okay, anyway. Irenaeus, these men believe things. These men, sent Eskender on his merry way. These men believe things such as infant baptismal regeneration, water baptismal regeneration, communion of the saints, and the perpetual virginity of Mary, things that if you believe are damnable, then that means God forbid such blasphemy. Jesus failed to preserve his church or didn't care what happened to his church, or you're going to have to admit, understand where I'm going with this. These doctrines were accepted by Christ, were permitted by Christ, were allowed by Christ because they were not damnable, and he accepted them and permitted them. Therefore, if that's the case, why then, if you're a Protestant, would you look to a Catholic or Orthodox and Coptic and say, these beliefs are damnable, you're not a brother and sister, you're going to hell? Orthodox Y, are you talking to me now again? Hold on, hold on. Man, Orthodox Y is really brave. In order to say that I don't know as if he knows. Okay, Orthodox Y. Me? We're now going to send you to Asheron. Because now you're barking like a rabid dog, I have to muzzle muzzle you. Bye-bye, doggy. You see? A jerk lowlife who is a bad representation of his church. Send him on his way. Bye-bye. I'm going to sing you a Syrian song. Sergeant Gabriel. Bye-bye. 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 Bye, 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 bye. That's an Assyrian song. You have to be Assyrian to know that. Right? So you Assyrians. Okay, folks. My time, it's 1.45 p.m. If I do a second set, thank you, my precious sister, Nana. The Lord Jesus shine his face on you. All my brothers and sisters here from all the various traditions. And I consider you my brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? You from the Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church, from the Assyrian Church of East, the Church of my ancestors, the Nestorian Church. The Roman, you are my brothers, sisters in Christ. If you're in love with Jesus, born of his spirit, you love his word, and you're, you're doing your best to understand it and live it out, and pray for me that I'm truly your brother and not a false teacher, a hypocrite, and then God will save me from my flesh because I am weak at times. My flesh can be strong, but the Holy Spirit is stronger still. May he give me purity for the glory of Jesus and pray for my angels that God will fight for us. Now, with that said, it's 1.45. I can come back on in 45 minutes. I can do another session on the term sons of God, 2.30 p.m. my time. It's 1.45 p.m. now. How many of you guys will come back if I do a second session? 2.30 p.m. in 45 minutes. 2.30 p.m. would be 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Canadian time. 
3.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. You guys ready? Okay, let people know. Invite them. I'll see you, God willing, in 45 minutes. Pray. All right? Pray that God will fill me with the Holy Spirit to be truly a holy slave of Jesus and to be your brother and to love you for the sake of Jesus. Christ is risen, risen indeed. I'll see you in 45 minutes, God willing.